eight, ten. I think we can get started if you'd like. Okay. So hi everybody. My name is Dana Humphrey. I'm Dean of Engineering at the University of Maine. Thank you so much for joining us for this live virtual tour. I said my name's Dana Humphrey, but everybody just calls me Dana. Uh, today we've had just a little bit of light snow. It's an absolutely beautiful day on the UMaine campus. I'm standing in front of the construction site for the Furlan Engineering Education and Design Center. Very exciting project from the UMaine campus. This is a $78 million project. It's going to add about 108,000 square feet. What you can see behind me is the bottom of a really big red crane. That's actually a 120 ton capacity red crane that they're taking and using to pick up the pieces of steel for this project. Now, let me tell you a little bit about the project itself. Uh, what we have on the first floor is we have our student project design suite. This is roughly half of the first floor. We're going to have a workbench area where we have 48 workbenches that we can assign to a group of students for a semester or a year. So that's going to be your space where you can take and build your stuff. And then the workbench area is surrounded by shops. We are actually going to fabricate components. So we have a biomedical engineering shop, we have a 3D printing shop, we have a, a electronic shop, a tool crib, a vehicle shop, a metal shop, a wood shop, and a composite shop. So what you're going to do is you're going to go out to the appropriate shops, take and fabricate components for your project, come back out to your bench, take and put them together, test it out, debug it, go back out to the appropriate shops and take and modify parts. Uh, and this is going to be the best space of its kind in the Northeast. Uh, students are going to be able to take and use this certainly for their senior capstone projects, but other projects for classes, as well as as long as you've had training, other projects uh, in there. When I say training, get out safety training to work in the uh, work in the lab. As I said, this is going to be the best space of its kind in the Northeast. Also on the first floor of this building is going to be our student commons. This is going to be the gathering place for all undergraduate engineering students. We've got tables and chairs and sofas, comfortable places where you can go and hang out, work on projects, uh, take and chat with your friends. We're going to have food service available. This is going to be a magnet for all the students uh, in the college. And that's also going to be on the first floor. On every floor of the building, we're going to have collaborative classrooms. These are classrooms where you'll actually sit at tables of six with a large screen monitor at the end of each table. Uh, you're going to take and work on problems with, uh, with, your, with your classmates under the guidance of the faculty member. We're going to have these on every floor of this, uh, this three-story building. Uh, in addition, on the first floor, we're going to have really key teaching space for our mechanical engineering uh, technology program. Uh, this is a space where we're going to have uh, milling machines uh, and uh, and lays and such will be a key part of your education uh, at the University of Maine as you actually learn how to operate the machines, fabricate parts, uh, and get ready to actually oversee those kind of operations when you get out into the workplace. Uh, then we go up to the second floor. The second floor of the building is primarily mechanical engineering, where we're going to have our mechanical engineering teaching labs, uh, and then we're going to have uh, mechanical engineering faculty. Uh, classrooms are on that floor as well. Up on the third floor, that's primarily biomedical engineering. We have a vibrant, growing biomedical engineering program. They're going to have their teaching labs on the second floor, as well as their research labs and faculty offices. Uh, so this three-story building is absolutely going to be just awesome, awesome space. Uh, and this is going to be the, the heart of, uh, of, the, uh, of your engineering education uh, at the University of Maine. Now, this project is under construction right now. Uh, uh, we're going to have the structural steel completed. And if we take a look a little bit more off to the side, you can take and see some of the steel that's going up there. If you're to look out here on Monday, here we are on Thursday, look out here on Monday, basically that steel wasn't there. That's going up this week. Uh, and what we're doing, uh, and so they're putting up a tractor trail load of steel about every other day right now. So things are happening very, very fast on this project. And of course, the project itself is an engineering marvel. Uh, we have uh, many UMaine engineering graduates working on this project. Uh, we have uh, structural engineers who graduated from the University of Maine that are on this project. We have construction management, uh, construction engineering technology graduates who are on this project. 
the electrical on the, the engineer on this project, Stephanie LaPlante. She's a, she's a UMaine graduate. So this in, in itself is an engineering achievement, just to be able to take and design and build a project, uh, project uh, uh, such as this. Now this project is gonna be completed in the uh, summer of 2022. For those of you who are seniors, when you come to the University of Maine campus next fall uh, to, to be a first year student, we'll still have one year left uh, to build this building. Uh, but then uh, when you come back for your sophomore year, this building is done and you're in the building. And during your first year, you're actually gonna get to see this building uh, take, its, uh, take its final shape uh, and get, uh, get fully outfitted. So just seeing that project happen itself is just a great, uh, a great, great thing. Uh, say a few more words about our engineering program. We have 11 different engineering degrees. We have civil engineering, uh, mechanical engineering, electrical engineering, computer engineering, chemical engineering, biomedical engineering, engineering physics. And then we have for technology programs, we have construction engineering technology, mechanical engineering technology, surveying engineering technology, and electrical engineering technology. Uh, and we're a program that's big enough so we've got a lot of choices in terms of what you can take and study here, but you're sm or small enough that you're gonna know your faculty by their first name. So my name's Dana, and actually, I, even though I'm Dean, I still teach, you can actually come here and have me uh, for one of, your, one of your classes. So we're just the right size uh, university. Uh, so, uh, so that's what we've got here on the construction site. Uh, primarily what we're gonna be focusing on today is gonna be focusing on uh, both our chemical engineering and our biomedical engineering program. So we're gonna take a little bit of a walk and kind of head over to that part of campus and we'll keep talking uh, as we go here. So what's it like to take and, and study engineering at the University of Maine? Uh, you're gonna have engineering classes from your very first semester. We wanna give you the fun of being an engineer right from the start. Certainly in the first semester, you're taking some math courses, some science courses to take and build up some of the skills you need uh, to be an engineer, but you're gonna be in engineering courses right from the first semester. I'll give an example. So civil engineering students, they start with a, with a course called materials, where you learn about concrete, steel, wood, plastics, the materials that civil engineers actually build things out of. It's taught by Eric Landis. Eric is a distinguished main professor, which is the highest award that a faculty member on our campus can receive. He's absolutely awesome. Uh, uh, the students rate the faculty on a scale of one to five, uh, one being perfect. Eric usually gets about 1.1 1. Uh, 1. 1 for his average rating as uh, close to perfect as you can get. Now it's got a lab that goes along with it. Uh, and an important question for civil engineers is how strong is something? So what you do, how do you find that out? You actually load things to failure. So we're gonna give you, if you're a civil engineer, in the first semester, we're gonna give you college credit for breaking things. What could be more fun than that? Uh, if you're an electrical engineer, uh, this year, what the students made, these students actually made their own oscilloscope that they can then take and use uh, for the rest of their time at the University of Maine. So we're giving you a great hands-on experience right from the very, very beginning. Certainly as you take and work your way up to our program, you're taking more engineering courses, certainly a few more science courses too. Uh, and uh, then by the time you get to be a senior, going to take and uh, do your senior capstone project. Several of our programs uh, actually build their projects. So, uh, so for example, mechanical engineers, they build projects. Uh, and uh, one of the projects we did with them uh, was they took a conventional snowmobile. We do a snow in Maine. See, we have snow. Uh, and uh, they converted a conventional snowmobile to run on compressed natural gas rather than gasoline. Great, great project. And again, very hands-on. All right, so we're getting ready to cross the street here, so let's pay attention. There we go. Yeah, if the dean gets run over by a car crossing the street live on the internet, that's very, very bad. We don't want that to happen. Uh, so I'm gonna step off on the, uh, on the sidewalk here. Uh, so, uh, so what kind of outcomes do our students have? 
So the placement rate for our graduates is 99%. So we've got a great connection between a great hands-on engineering education and employers love to hire our graduates. Last year we had 170 to 180 companies that were here at our engineering job fair literally competing against each other to take and hire our graduates. Uh, and so that 99% placement rate means that within six months after graduation, 99% reported they're either employed full-time or in graduate school full-time. I'll actually let you in on a little secret. The most recent survey, it actually came back as 100%. Everybody reported that they're either employed full-time or in grad school full-time. So now we're heading into Jeanette's Hall. This is the home of uh, in biomedical engineering. Uh, and it gives me a great pleasure to actually turn the, uh, turn the camera over here now to Hemet Pensey. Hemet is chair of the Department of Chemical and Biomedical Engineering, uh, one of my longtime colleagues here at the University of Maine. So I'm going to turn it over to Hemet, and then I'll see you again at the very end. So Hemet, if you could take it from here, please. Hi. Good afternoon to all in a nice snowy afternoon. Already main hello for everybody. We are waiting here and I want you to know that in spite of the finals week, we have four faculty members and several of our students here waiting and anxious to give you our live too. So welcome to Janess Hall. That's the home for a chemical and biomedical engineering program. We're gonna talk about both programs and you will know when we switch from chemical to biomedical or vice versa. And you will get direct information from our juniors and seniors as to why they came to University of Maine, what they are doing at the University of Maine and what are their plans after graduation. So without much ado, let's get started with the facilities part and we're gonna walk over to our process development center which is a $6 million facility. And we do $1 million worth of business here from our industrial client. And we're gonna talk about some exciting things we are doing in this process development plan. And how it helps our undergraduate students is you might get a job here and you'll be working here, earn some money while you are going to school and get interaction with our real clients from the business world. So two things you're gonna see is our pilot paper machine and the new specialty paper that we just made a few weeks ago that Donna Johnson is gonna talk about. Donna? Hi, I'm Donna Johnson, uh, research manager at the Process Development Center. Where you're at at the moment. Um, we, uh, we, uh, we want to talk about the um, hand sanitizer at the moment. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, at the beginning of the of the uh, pandemic, we were um, making hand sanitizer to supply to um, um, basically throughout the state through um, NEMA, um, and we made probably about uh, 3,000 gallons total and distributed uh, throughout the state. Um, and right now we're making it at smaller amounts um, for use on, on campus as needed. Um, so right now we're gonna be talking here about um, uh, cellulose nanofibrils, uh, nanocellulose, uh, which is a, a product that we make um, starting with, this is a sheet of pulp, um, and we refine it in the disc refiner uh, to make a kind of pudding-like substance, um, which has different properties than regular pulp does. Um, if you partially dry it and freeze dry it, it's kind of a foam-like material. If you dry it further, it's uh, a very, very hard, um, uh, millable kind of material. It can be made into um, films uh, of various kinds and uh, as uh, Hennant said, a couple of weeks ago, we did a paper machine trial. These are samples from the paper machine trial. Um, if you look over here, there's a, a roll that came off the paper machine. So that's our product. And these piles are those cut up. Um, and what we did was make a sheet of paper 
and put some of this material on the surface of that sheet of paper. Um, so you can't necessarily see, but this is uh, material without the, without the um, CNF on it, and this is with the CNF on it. That curl is due in part to, to that material on the surface of the sheet. Now why we're doing this is to um, develop barrier properties, um, and barrier properties can be a number of things. Um, you might want some resistance to water, resistance to um, oxygen, and in this case we're looking at um, oil and grease resistance. So if you were making uh, uh, paper for food wrapping in your pizza box or whatever, that kind of thing is what we're um, looking at developing here. So we make this material in back here. Um, we're in the middle of um, construction. We're uh, uh, expanding our refiner lab. Uh, we've got a, a million dollar grant to, to do that. And so um, the refiner that we are originally used to, to make that material with is packed up and ready to go and get rebuilt um, here. And over here are um, three new refiners. Um, the refiner is made, let's see, over here is a plate that goes into the refiner. So you would put those plates, you would put a pair of those plates, actually four of those plates, in this refiner. And in a pair, one is still and one is rotating. And so the pulp goes between those and that develops um, the properties that you want. Um, so in this expansion, uh, well, right now when we do that, we're doing it in a batch system. So it uh, goes from a tank through the refiner back to the tank again. But part of this expansion is so that we can do that discontinuously. So you'll put material in, go through the refiner and, and come out as a, as a finished product. And so over here, we have uh, some of our material. So these were processed to two different levels basically in the refiner and so we, this material is what we used on the paper machine to, to make sheets of paper. Um, so that's kind of our process for this and we'll go back over here and, and talk um, to people about the unit ops. And this is Sarah Walton. Hi, thank you guys. Uh, so I'm Sarah Walton. I'm a lecturer in chemical engineering. I teach a variety of classes for undergraduate chemical engineering majors. Uh, statistical process control in the spring and we do senior capstone and this semester we were doing what's called the unit operations laboratory. So during the fall we were running this distillation column here. Um, and Austin here is one of my students, so he's going to show you a little bit about what it looks like when the students are in here. This is more of a, a dramatic reenactment since the labs ended a couple weeks ago and we're uh, just finishing up some report writing. So our labs are in the junior and senior level class uh, years that you would take these and you work in groups of three or four and you would run kind of a pilot scale piece of equipment like our distillation column here or uh, our heat exchanger for process control or an evaporator or small reactor. Uh, you usually would spend a few weeks, first you have to design your experiment, figure out which variables you're gonna change, what kind of output product you're gonna measure, and then from there, um, you, you set up and you run and you collect some data and you see if that all goes according to plan, and if not, you might come back in and, and change the plan, try to collect more data and make sure that you validate your results. Uh, so, let's maybe wander a little bit closer this way. With our uh, distillation column in action. You can see it bubbling away. So 
in, uh, in chemical engineering, we deal a lot with separations, not just reactions like you might think about for you know, a chemical reaction. We take a raw material and we want to make a finished product with it. So once we've done the reaction, we often will need to separate different mixtures of a, a component, uh, different components within a mixture. And if our mixture happens to be two liquids that are combined together, like uh, water and ethanol is our typical thing we run here, uh, you would use the distillation column taking advantage of the fact that ethanol boils at a lower temperature than water. So the ethanol is gonna rise up to the top of the column and come off as our product through the condenser. And then our water comes out the bottom and uh, should be mostly water from the distillery here. Uh, let's see. I think Austin is going to tell us a little bit about his experience as a student in the lab and maybe just a little bit in general about uh, his experience as a student here at UMaine in chemical engineering. So hi everyone, uh, my name is Austin Gilbo. I'm a senior chemical engineering student from North J. Maine. Uh, so this after graduation, uh, my plans are to work at Sappy Summer Stuff. I've already signed a, an offer with them. Uh, so I'm really excited about that. Um, but I'm going to tell you a little bit about the distillation column and kind of the labs. So um, I guess Professor Walton did a pretty good job kind of summarizing the labs and the, the group work that we do. Uh, we do written reports and we do also oral reports at the very end. So these reports are to our classmates, they're to our faculty members and just to kind of work on our, I guess, our verbal skills and our written skills as well. Um, so this specific uh, column, Professor Walton had said it, uh, it does ethanol water mixture solutions. So um, this is an example. Um, so this is hand sanitizer at 70% ethanol, uh, which is a regular industrial grade uh, hand sanitizer. We've actually made this in the lab with this distillation column. So, um, the, the time it need, or it was the time it need around April, um, we were actually using our resources to make hand sanitizer for people in need or people in the community. So it's really kind of cool that we get to do hands-on experience and also help you know the, the greater community. So that's really cool. Um, this stuff we actually learn about before we get our hands on it. So we learn about separation, liquid separation. We learn about boiling points, things like that. Um, and then after that, we actually get a chance to apply uh, our knowledge here. So the, uh, the column is running at approximately 200 degrees Fahrenheit uh, to separate uh, our ethanol, which comes off the top, and our water, which comes off the bottom. Uh, so I'll, I'll actually go up and show you a sample that, that we can take off of it. So this is a sample that we can take. Um, there's five different, I guess, places that we can sample, see how our distillation column is doing, what things that we need to adjust, what things that we can keep the same uh, to run them the most efficient with the least cost um, and, and make a product that we need. So it's really cool that we get to, be, to do this, um, I guess, apply our knowledge over the learning class. Is this a, a bubble cap? Oh, yeah. This is a tray from the column. So this is what where the separation of the water and the alcohol is happening. The vapor will go up and the liquid will be sitting on the trays and draining down through the hole here. So yeah, um, I think that's pretty much it with this distillation column. This will be the same distillation column that you can see in uh, like Louisiana or in the Gulf Coast separating oil and water. Um, or different oil substances. Um, so it's kind of cool that, again, we get to use this, this research in, in our own building here. Can you talk about your co-op experience? Yeah, yeah, I can tell them a little bit about my co-op. Um, so I co-op for a, uh, a paper company uh, called Westrock. 
So Westrock is a company that makes Domino's pizza boxes. They also make Amazon boxes, just, I guess, uh, consumer grade cardboard. Um, this company was in West Point, Virginia. So I went down there for two terms, one last summer and then one this spring. And um, basically you're, you're an engineer. So they put you, you're still in school, you get paid to do this co-op or internship and you can kind of get real application of stuff that you learned in class or knowledge that you picked up kind of in, in labs and things like that. So um, I, I guess the, the knowledge that you learn will not be wasted. Uh, there's a lot of stuff you will, you will need to learn, um, but it's really cool that we get to do that here and then apply that somewhere else even before we graduate. So um, the classes that we miss, like I said, I'd taken a co-op or internship term in the spring. So we get to take those classes that following summer so that we can still graduate in the four years. Uh, I'm not sure, Jordan may be able to talk to you a little bit more about her co-op experience, but um, that's kind of how it works here. So it's nice that you can still do two terms of a co-op, which companies love to see coming right out of college, and you as well get to uh, graduate in, in the four years. So um, I, I think that's all I have here. Uh, thank you guys very much. Uh, so we are going to wander down and take a quick look at one of the other operations, um, unit ops labs that we run here. So another class that I'm about to uh, start teaching next year is called process control. It's really important in the chemical production industries that we do everything automated and online. Uh, so one of the labs that we run here, it, it sounds kind of simple. We uh, have this heat exchanger and cold water comes in and you have steam outside of the, the, um, the tubes to heat it up. Uh, and like we do that in our showers every day, but we wanna control that with the computer. And so the heat exchanger is up there and you can see that valve with the big yellow arrow. So I can tell this computer right here uh, that I want to open that valve. program so it's measuring uh, the water temperatures and the water flow rate and that steam valve there if I um, if my water flow coming in suddenly drops because the paper machine is pulling water and my steam doesn't adjust then I would heat my water up too much and if that's going into a reactor that would be bad we don't want to have our temperature kind of run away if it's an exothermic reactor uh, so it's important for us to be able to control things within this um, computerized system. So if I tell this valve that I want it to open from the computer, it's going to obey my command. Uh, and it should go to 50% open from zero when I hit the button. Yeah. Uh, and then I'm going to just turn it off because that's just for a, a very brief demonstration. Back down. Okay, so process control is a way to Right, um, we call them proportional integral derivative control or PID controllers. It's kind of like in your car when you're driving up a hill and you're on cruise control. If you, um, the car needs to give it more gas to maintain the same speed up the hill. The process PID controllers that we write, the students learn how to write them. Um, same concept, but we might deal with flow rates or tank levels or uh, temperatures, other things that are going to affect processes in the chemical manufacturing. Um, so we try to teach in the various classes a lot of different skills that will help you be successful going out into this manufacturing uh, industry. A lot of our students go out into the pulp and paper industry about, I wanna say about 50% of our graduates who leave here and go to industry end up in pulp and paper, maybe even a little more than that. Uh, and it, it's a really great opportunity for them. The starting salary is about $74,000 a year. So not bad money. Uh, and a fair number of our students are on full tuition or very close to full tuition scholarship through the Pulp and Paper Foundation. Uh, so we're about to go and talk with one of those students and see the uh, Pulp and Paper Foundation office. I actually went to school here at UMaine a, a while back on a full tuition and paper ride. So it was a, a good way to 
come out of school debt free as a chemical engineer. We support about 100 students on these scholarships. And as we're walking, all the plaques that you see on the wall, these are the names of donors who have given back, and the building is just kind of full of these. Uh, so we're outside the Pulp and Paper Foundation uh, Scholarship Office right now, and this is our student, Jordan Gregory, who is going to tell you a little bit more about her experience, maybe as a foundation scholar, or uh, what co-op and other things that, that you may hear alike as a chemical engineering student. Thank you. Hi everyone, my name is Jordan. I am a third year chemical engineering student here at UMaine. Um, I'm from Mine at Maine, which is about two hours south from here. And I chose to come to UMaine um, for the engineering program in Pulp and Paper. They gave me a scholarship um, to come here. And then since being here, I've enjoyed um, my classes, meeting new people, participating in different clubs, and having different experiences on campus as well. Um, I also, my junior year of high school, I went to Considering Engineering, which is a summer program for people who are interested in engineering but not sure what types of engineering they want to um, go into. And you come here um, for a couple days and you go and learn about all the different engineering programs. You get to do hands-on activities within those um, different programs as well. So that was a great experience that I had. And because of that, I decided to apply for the Pulp and Paper Scholarship and they gave me a lot of different opportunities since coming here. I was able to, after my first year, co-op at Verso Paper Mill in Jay. Um, I was able to do a lot of hands-on experience. I was a process engineering intern, doing a lot of data analysis and things like that. And then last summer, I was able to co-op with Selenis, which is a chemical supplier company at the ND Rumford, in ND Paper in Rumford. And there I did a lot of testing and working on the machine and doing a lot of hands-on work as well. And then I'm actually going back there next summer to do another internship just to keep learning, getting that hands-on experience um, that can always help me um, further in life after I graduate as well. So I've had a lot of good experiences here at UMaine, learned a lot and thankful for all of my professors and the people in the Pulp and Paper Foundation and the program all together for the opportunities that they've given me here, so. Yeah, and then now, um, Professor Schwartz will continue with the tour. All right, hi, so my name's Tom Schwartz. I'm an assistant professor in chemical engineering here. Uh, and we'll walk a little bit further down the, the hallway here and get you a little more of a sense of what Gen S Hall is like. Um, and so Gen S Hall, while you're here as an undergrad, really kind of becomes a bit of your second home. Uh, and I say that having actually been an undergraduate here myself about 15 years ago, uh, and one of the things that I can attest to is, is uh, from my own experience, is actually uh, the tremendous sense of community that we have uh, with your classmates. Uh, even 15 years later, I still see a lot of my friends from, uh, uh, from my undergrad days. We all go and see each other at, at weddings, and, and now they're all everybody's having babies. Uh, and so we really do develop uh, a sense of community um, that will stay with you for the rest of your life. So um, another uh, area that we have in the building here is another one of our unit operations laboratories. Uh, and in this lab, we uh, tend to look at experiments that are a little bit smaller scale than what you saw downstairs. Uh, here, we're actually working on uh, systems that might be a little bit more uh, hazardous for you to learn uh, at full scale. And so instead, we'll work uh, first on how to run things like chemical reactors uh, at a more manageable scale. Uh, and so here to talk about some of her experiences with that is Erin Atchison, who's a senior in um, uh, chemical engineering, uh, and she can talk about her experiences with the reactor systems here and, and the UNIDOPS lab. Right, yeah, so basically what we have here is we have a catalytic reactor. So the um, experiment that we use this to run is we were looking at the acid hy uh, hydrolyzed conversion of sucrose into glucose and fructose. So we use the bench top scale, basically like Professor Schwartz said, to um, kind of do this at a more manageable level and really get a feel for how things work. So basically you would have something like your, um, your feed container with your sucrose that you would feed into the reactor through a tube. Um, in here is a packed catalyst, which helps to, or which actually reacts what you're feeding into your reactor and it's heated through the outer shell of the tube with hot water. So you would feed your, um, solution in through the reactor, it would react and you would be able to collect your samples out the end um, to, to test for things like your conversion. 
So basically the whole point of that lab is to look at how different parameters like your feed flow rate or your catalyst particle size are going to affect uh, the conversion of your reaction. And then we can test that using analytical instrumentation like the spectrophotometer here, which measures the absorbance of um, light from your sample, which we can use to inadvertently calculate whatever the concentration of your reactants outside of the reactor are. So that's just kind of a brief overview of how these types of labs work. You basically have um, some kind of uh, reactor scheme, you have some kind of uh, process that you're working with, and then you use analytical instrumentation at the end to analyze uh, your samples, and then you analyze your data to um, get your final results. And so if there's actually one other thing that we can ask Erin about, she uh, had the opportunity to spend a year interning with NASA, uh, and so she can maybe tell us a little bit about her experiences with, uh, with NASA. Yeah, so I was fortunate enough to be accepted into three NASA internships um, through this past year. The first internship that I did was in contamination control engineering and planetary protection. Uh, my main project there was looking at doing mechanical and environmental testing for spaceflight hardware for um, the, the Mars rover, actually, which just uh, lifted off in July. And then my second project was looking at um, re doing research for life support systems on the International Space Station. So both of those were incredibly rewarding and I was able to get the experience to do things like that through the chemical engineering program here because uh, you know, you, you don't really think about the, the different types of engineering um, and how they sort of coincide with what you're doing. But through the chemical engineering program here, we actually got a taste of a whole bunch of different types of engineering that were really applicable to my different internships with NASA. So not only did I do chemical engineering, but I got experience in material science, mechanical engineering, test engineering, and all of those things actually were incorporated into my internships. And without them, I probably wouldn't have been selected. So it was a really great experience and I'm really fortunate to have been able to, to do something like that. All right. Uh, and so next we'll take you out uh, over to see uh, Professors Tilbury and Weeks. I don't know who's going first, but they'll talk about uh, the biomedical side of our department. So. so now that you heard about the exciting side of chemical engineering, now you get to hear about our very exciting side. So we have some fantastic students all ready to show you their projects they're working on. So these are in-class projects. And uh, actually up first we have Jordan Miner, who's here to pull out some examples in her, her super hand. Um, to talk about one of the projects we do in our unit ops lab where we design a prosthetic hand and uh, in Jordan's case she uh, went all out and made an Iron Man hand. So I'll Jordan you explain her projects. Hello everyone, uh, my name is Jordan Miner. I am a senior this year. Uh, my major is biomedical engineering but I also have um, a double minor in electrical engineering and bioinstrumentation. Um, so I originally chose UMaine not only due to its um, exceptional ed um, education program, but also just because of the campus and as well as the surrounding community. Orono is just such a great place and I've enjoyed all four years here. Um, so this project we did my junior year. Um, this was my hand. So this is our Iron Man hand. So what each um, group does is they um, pick a theme. So clearly my theme was the Iron Man, but there are a lot of different themes chosen here. And they do this for a purpose. So what we wanted to do was empower young kids to feel like a superhero, even though they've lost part of their hand. So some functionalities includes, we have a little SD card, which is loaded with a bunch of um, Tony Stark's audio clips, and they can play those with these buttons. And we also have a little laser, as well as our little Iron Man tant here with some um, fabric you can take out in machine wash. So it just activated using simple wrist activation. Um, some other ones that we have, we have um, this one allows you to use your cell phone with it. And it also has a temperature and pressure sensor. And each one is kind of designed with their own theme in mind. And each group kind of takes an individual spin on it. So some of the other projects that our students work on in our labs is we do um, a bunch of different small design projects. So. Um, the hand one is one of our larger ones. To build up to that, we have some of our other projects, is we make a small inline IV mixer. So we need to mix two fluids together. It needs to be able to be small, disposable, economical for different uses. So we design this, we, um, they print it, and they test it. So we have Evan here, 
who is all set and ready to actually show his mixer in action. So you can see where we have two colored fluids. We have yellow and blue moving together. And in the mixer, we can see it actually mixes quite quickly. And we end up with a nice, pretty green at the end, showcasing that the, uh, the mixer is actually doing its job and doing it very well. Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, like Professor Weeks said, my name is Evan Bess. I'm a third year biomedical engineering student. Um, and, and we actually, as students, develop uh, research, design, and print these inline micromixers here at the university. Um, this was an, an important application uh, for me specifically uh, as I used my biomedical engineering degree as a stepping stone to go to medical school. Um, I chose the University of Maine because um, I'm a local kid. You know, I'm from central Maine, um, and it, it was the best uh, education uh, that I could choose. Thank you. Thank you. So now I'm going to hand it off to Dr. Tilbury, and she's going to talk about uh, their capstone process and some research for our students. Yes. So after you get through those labs, what's next? Well, we have to cap it off with something, and that's what we're going to do. We're going to walk down the hallway into our special capstone room. And I'm going to introduce Liza White for you. Uh, she's going to talk a little bit about her capstone project that she's working on this semester. So yes, capstone is still ongoing despite being in a remote situation. So Liza can talk to you about the struggles, the excitement that that brings. And I like to tell them that they're getting to experience what remote work, working from home, the, the sort of the idyllic work from home situation that a lot of graduates think they may want. They're getting to experience it and see is that what I want, or do I want to go into office building and work there? So with further ado, fly the white. Yeah, absolutely. So this year, my capstone is working with rescue situations. So last year, they used aviation to look at rescue situations of finding patients in the air, and they wanted to see how the pilot stresses were indicated, so that that works on like their heart rate and their if there's sweat on their skin. This year though, we're working on the ground situation, which is more patient driven. So what you see here is a Stokes basket. This is typically what a patient is in. And then from the Stokes basket, they go into a rescue sled that is towed by a snowing machine. A snowing machine. And um, with this, we're working on trying to get more patient care so that the providers can transport the patient and treat them at the same time. So we're really looking at adding vitals to this, and it's a great opportunity for me to intermix my EMS experience as I work as an EMT at UVAC, which is a ambulance service on campus, and I get to take that experience and work with my teammates to hopefully make an awesome product. And hopefully next year I can take this into the industry and work on making medical devices. Right. Beyond capstone experience, Liza's also participated in a co-op experience where she was an intern at Eastern Maine, right at the very beginning, right as COVID was starting to hit. So I wonder if you could elaborate a little bit about what it was like to be a hospital intern, clinical engineer at the start of COVID. Yeah, so I was given a unique opportunity just because I wasn't even expecting COVID to even happen. And then I was just thrown right in. So I was helping other clinical engineers at Eastern Maine Medical Center get the the ICU rooms ready for the COVID patients. This included having the equipment on the outside of the rooms, which we had to test to make sure it was safe for the patients. And then also I worked on trying to reprocess N95s in case there was that shortage that was predicted. Luckily, we didn't really have to amount to that, but yeah, it was given a huge opportunity that UMaine provided me just by being in this program. All right. Thank you, Liza. We're going to move down the hallway a little bit and talk more about real world opportunities that are also afforded to our students, um, primarily through the form of research. So in biomedical engineering education, undergraduate research is a little bit more important than maybe other engineering disciplines. And because of our small size, we have the ability to offer and afford undergrad to faculty direct interaction in the research labs. So I'm going to have you turn around and I'm going to introduce uh, Jordan Miner, who's been a main top scholar, and she's been in my research group since her freshman year, and now she's a senior. 
and I won't spoil the surprise about what her plans are for the future. Yeah, hello again everyone. So um, I'm really enjoying my time at the University of Maine. Um, this right here is actually my poster that I've done three years of research on. Um, so the University of Maine has allowed me to do research all four years, which is amazing. I've learned so much from this experience and that actually helped me get um, two internships one at IDEX and one at NASA. So there's so many different opportunities that the University of Maine offers. Um, so my poster here, what we did is we used second harmonic generation imaging and we imaged zebrafish with Duchenne muscular dystrophy. So what we were trying to do is see um, how strength training um, interfered with the uh, muscle structure. So we did is we simulated them with electrical stimulations that mimic different types of exercise. And now what we actually found was that if you mimicked endurance strength training, it increased the sarcomere distance, which are the fundamental units of a muscle. And so that means we think that um, endurance strength training may be um, a huge breakthrough in um, determining the exercise regimen a person with Duchenne muscular dystrophy should do to improve their condition since there is no cure. Again, this research is still ongoing and I'm just really excited to have been a part of it for the last three years. Has any part of it been published or in the process of being published? It is being in the po process of being published. I worked with Elizabeth Kilroy in the biology department. She did more of the zebrafish biology section while I did more of the imaging section. Um, so she just um, got her PhD and it is in the works of being published and we're eagerly awaiting that. All right. So we're going to continue down the hallway and we're going to, I'm going to introduce you to the next uh, undergrad, Josh Hamilton. He's a senior and he's actually going to talk with you on the way down the stairs about the opportunities that he's been afforded throughout the undergrad, particularly focusing in, in on, can I do an engineering degree and still do honors? I can tell you that Josh is a very hardworking student and he has figured it out. And if you're interested in kind of having a more holistic education experience and, and you love the history and you love kind of philosophical thinking, Josh is the man for you. He, he's not only an engineering student, he also is a jazz musician and, and just very, very well cultured and very impressive to me, so. Yeah, to jump in on that, including the jazz musician stuff, the University of Maine also offers a visual and music performing arts scholarship. So that's part of the reason I came to University of Maine. So yeah, I'm Josh, I'm from Elton, Maine. I live nearby. So University of Maine is a very affordable option. And all four years I have done research through Center of Undergraduate Research Grants, and through the Honors College. So the Honors College offers like, and got to move. But the Honors College offers multiple uh, scholarships for students for thesis scholarships. So for example, you can apply to scholarships with any sort of thesis idea. It doesn't have to be in engineering. It could be other research in biology and chemistry. It could be a music performance. It could be an artistic performance. So there's like a lot of different opportunities to get funding for what you need and for my personal experiences, I want to be a professor and help others. So at the University of Maine, there's a tutor program. So I'm an area coordinator of the tutor program, and I get to tutor my peers and help teach other people better ways of teaching and learn how to teach others. And the honors uh, thesis process has helped me go practice for my thesis process for when I want to go to grad school for a master's or PhD. And the honors program really offers a more holistic approach. It's like an alternative to your gen, your gen ed requirements. And to do that, it takes more work than just the undergraduate engineering degree. But I've only had to take like a one or two summer classes to be able to fit it into my schedule. And all the professors and your advisor will work with you and help you through the way of fitting that sort of stuff into your schedule. Everyone is very helpful here. So I, I think I'm going to bring you guys over to some freshmen or sophomores who've been doing research. And Dr. Weeks will take you away. Hi again. Now you've seen what our students do when they get to upperclassmen years and what their culmination effects are. Um, I thought I'd give you a nice preview of what some of our underclassmen do. So I actually have Zoe here, who's actually going to talk about one of her projects that she did in class, um, where they did some real world engineering problems solving a problem that uh, a rural uh, emergency medical system has, where she's working on an IV warmer. Hi, I'm Zoe Bidham. I am a second year biomedical engineering student here at the University of Maine, and this is our final design project for our second year class. We were tasked to design an IV warmer that could be implemented in ambulances in a rural environment, so some things like low cost are very important for us. And we were able to combine everything that we learned throughout the year to make this system. So. 
not only were we able to design it, but we actually, this is a real 3D model that we generated um, together as a group of our system. And the idea generally is that IV bags are consistent width and depth, but they're vary in height depending on the size of the IV bag. So we were able to design this pocket system where you could actually just zip in your um, IV bag and it will allow it to heat the bag and change the, pres the pressure in the bag to generate different flow rates to get to your patient. So how we did that, we actually have a little video of how we were able to... So we use the, the idea that if you add different weights on top of the bag, it changes the pressure within the bag, which allows us to deliver different flow rates to our patient. So this is a quick video of kind of explaining how we did that. And in our design, you can see that you can place different sized weights in this pocket here. And it's kind of like a scrunched up sock in a way that as fluid leaves the bag, it will drain into the patient and the weight will can be continuously pressed on top of the bag. And fluid that's heated will fill the surrounding sac to keep our IV fluid at a consistent temperature for our patients. And we also had to do a small cost analysis on the entire system, um, as it was a real world engineering problem for something that was possibly going to be implemented somewhere like rural Maine. So we were able to um, not only come up with the design of the system, but have to think about how it'd be implemented in our communities. Uh, so I have another sophomore who actually has been doing a lot of research work. He has uh, been awarded a Cougar Award for his research, and he has some of his results up and ready to talk, talk to you about. So we have Chris here with some of his uh, image analysis results from uh, research work he does with Dr. Tilbury. So hello everyone, my name is Chris Roberts. I'm a current third year undergraduate at UMaine. Uh, some little history about myself. I'm originally from Fairfield. I graduated in 2018 with plans to get my bachelor's in computer engineering at UMaine. Uh, I always knew I wanted to go to UMaine because it's a beautiful campus and it's affordability. Uh, after some careful consideration, after my first year in computer engineering, I realized that's not something I particularly wanted to do. Um, so I took some classes in chemistry and biology and realized that's something I would much rather be involved with. Uh, so after talking to some of the professors, I enrolled in the BED program. Uh, and what I'll be talking about today is my research and how the BEM program helps me with both my career as an engineer and my future. Um, so initially, I didn't know anything about coding. I took, I was taking an ECE 177, which is a C class, but also the biomedical engineering class, BEN 112. Uh, in BEN 112, we learned a great foundation about basic programming knowledge, such as LabVIEW and Python. Um, but I'll talk about more of that later. Uh, after attending Dr. Tilbury's seminar uh, last year, she talked about something known as second harmonic generation. So without giving a physics lecture about light particles, it essentially just takes two photons of the same wavelength and makes it twice the frequency. Now, what that does is collagen reacts specifically to that wavelength. And as you can see here, we took files from a light microscope and we can kind of see the collagen in a 3D environment. Right here, you can see how it's reflecting off the cells right here. And we're able to use a program right here, which is known as Fiji. And Fiji is an image analysis tool that allows us to code certain things, certain properties that a computer would see with data that we can't see ourselves. Um, here I can show, oops, not the right one. It looks really messy, but here's our code that we use to program into PG. And the biomedical engineering program really helped with this because it teaches you that fundamental programming knowledge that otherwise you wouldn't know from previous experiences unless you took a programming class in high school, which my high school didn't have. Um, but essentially, this, this gets sent to a computer where we can segment it. and. Um, the overall goal of the project is to implement this in nearby hospitals so we could kind of preemptively check for cancerous cells in other wise ways we can. Um, I'm helping develop this code with a graduate, graduate student at UMaine uh, and 
I was able to do this because of the Center for Undergraduate Research, otherwise known as the Cougar. What the Cougar does is it helps undergraduates with funding that they otherwise wouldn't be able, wouldn't be able to get. Um, it can help with being able to you know, fund for basic needs or it can even fund the ability for the project itself. Um, I was able to get that, which allows me to further hand be able to do this research and have this great opportunity. That's all I need to say. All right, so now you've seen um, projects and different um, presentations for each or three of our different years. Now our biomedical engineering program prepares our students if they want to go into graduate school, which some of our students you talked to today are going to. Also prepares them to medical school. We always have multiple students who decide to go to medical school or right out into industry and be working engineers. Um, we have co-op programs where they can have some industrial experience during, the, uh, during their college experience also. So with that, I will be turning you back over to our uh, department head and our dean, right here in the main lobby of uh, Jeunesse. Welcome back. This is the Jeunesse Hall lobby. In usual days, this will become second home and you will be hanging out here early morning before your first class or later on at the end of the day. But we're gonna turn it over to Dean Humphrey, and there are two more students here to give you extra comments. Dana? Great, thanks, Emma. And actually, we're gonna go right to, uh, to Jordan and Aaron, so why don't you just step right up here and talk about the great experiences you've had uh, with NASA. So, so uh, just, just take, take it away, Jordan. So, um, my, I've had two internships. Um, my first one was at IDEX in Westbrook, Maine. Um, this one I was in their research and development department doing biochemistry research on an in-house pet um, diagnostic process. Um, and then that was in the um, spring of this year, um, so spring of 2020. And then in the fall, I transferred to NASA, Goddard Space Flight Center. Um, due to COVID, it was online, but I was able to do um, data analysis for them. So I do a lot of Python programming and working with Excel. Um, and I actually continued this internship into the fall. Um, and my last day is actually tomorrow for NASA. Um, but I've, I've developed a website using a framework called Django. And um, I'm actually going to get a um, publication out of NASA for it. So I'm really excited in that process as well. Yeah, so uh, I was fortunate enough to be able to do three internships with NASA over this past year. Uh, my first two were at Langley Research Center in Virginia, where I worked in contamination control engineering and planetary protection. My primary research project was working with some of the hardware on the Mars rover, which uh, launched in July. Uh, for that, basically, I did space um, environment and mechanical testing for the hardware and looked at different ways that um, contamination could affect things like the optical instrumentation that would also be going up with, um, with the rover. And then for my third internship with NASA, I did research on um, life support systems for the International Space Station. And so that research was primarily focused on looking at um, air contaminants and air filtration processes. And I was fortunate, fortunate enough to get to work with um, one of the PIs for a uh, Nobel Laureate, the um, Nobel Laureate for the uh, 2018 Nobel Prize in Chemistry, uh, where we were looking at doing um, protein engineering and machine learning methods, and how we could incorporate those into uh, contamination control systems and air filtration systems. And so it was a really great experience. It was really hands-on, uh, fast-paced, learned a lot. It was incredible. Well, great. Well, thank you, Jordan and Aaron, and to share the wonderful experience you had at NASA. 80% uh, of our students have at least one uh, internship opportunity or opportunity to have significant work in our laboratories here on campus. Some of the labs that you've not seen today include places like the Advanced Structures and Composites Center. We have the world's largest 3D printer. We can print 60 feet long by 20 feet wide by 10 feet tall. It's the biggest in the world. We got it here at the University of Maine. Uh, we also have a wind wave tank. We're on a scale basis. We can generate the equivalent of 100 foot waves and 200 mile power wind at, uh, at, at the same time. So we have lots to offer you uh, at the University of Maine. Thank you so much for joining us for this virtual tour. Uh, and what I just leave you with is we're gonna give you a great experience as a student here at the University of Maine. 
both what you're gonna do in your classes, what you're gonna do outside of your classes and some of the clubs and outside activities through internship opportunities, and then ultimately that full-time job at the end. And remember, we've got a 99% placement rate. Uh, I've been at the University of Maine now uh, for, uh, for about 35 years. I'm at the point where I have the children of my former students coming back and are in my class. Uh, 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 last year, I had a student whose first name was uh, Andrew in my class. Uh, very unusual last name. Uh, after the second class period, I asked him, uh, I pulled him aside and said, is your dad Don? And he goes, oh yes, my dad's Don. And I said, well, I had your dad in class. And this is what Andrew said. Andrew said, I know, and my dad said, if you can take a class from Dana, take a class from Dana. That's the kind of experience that you're gonna get at the University of Maine. That's why you should come here for your engineering degree. If you got any questions, just reach out to me. I'm Dana Humphrey, Dean of Engineering, and everybody just calls me Dana. Thank you for joining us today.